So we're broadcasting now for our webinar. This webinar is this webinar is part of the global conversation celebrating Thoreau's lasting legacy, sponsored by the Thoreau Society. There's more day to dawn. We hope that you will join us next next um, weekend on June 13th and 14th, where we'll have two full days of webinars. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's uh, speakers. Uh, but before that, I would like to encourage um, our viewers to consider checking out the Thoreau Society website, thoreausociety.com. And if you're not already a member of the Thoreau Society, to take a look at some of the benefits of membership, including a sample issue that you'll find on our homepage of the Thoreau Society Bulletin. It would be great to have new members. So today's presenters are Audrey Radin, who's written a book, When I Come to Die, Process and Prophecy in Thoreau's Vision of Dying. It was published in 2017. She lives in New York City with her husband, John, and their cats, Asher and Zoot, and is currently at work on a novel. Kristen Case, is co-editor of Thoreau at 200, published by Cambridge, 2016, and former editor of The Concord Saunterer. She directs Thoreau's Calendar, a digital archive of Thoreau's phenomenological mans manuscripts, and is the author of the introduction of the Penguin Classic Bicentennial Edition of Walden and Civil Disobedience, as well as several scholarly essays on Thoreau. She's also a poet, and Kristen is Associate Professor of English at the University of Maine at Farmington. I encourage you to visit her website at SPD Books where you can view her poetry. Rochelle Johnson serves on the Board of Directors of the Thoreau Society, teaches literature and the environment, humanities at the College of Idaho, where she also directs the Gibson Honors Program her publications focus on 19th century environmental thought with particular attention to Thoreau and his contemporaries. She has written and co-edited four books about 19th century writer and philanthropist Susan Fenimore Cooper. Details about her work appear on her website, rochellejohnson.com. Now I'll hand the meeting over to Rochelle who will um, conduct things from here, and I'll be back to join in at the Q&A. Thank you, Thanks everyone. So Thanks so much, Michael, and it's great to see you there at Thoreau Farm uh, in the birth room of Henry David Thoreau. I want to just say what an honor it is today to get to be in conversation with uh, my much admired colleagues, Audrey and Kristen. And um, we want to start by acknowledging the, um, the state of the world right now. When we developed the theme for this webinar, Thorough and Loss, we did so in a context, of course, of deep environmental crisis uh, and global pandemic. But what we didn't know then is um, the much deeper, greater relevance of that theme right now. Uh, in our moment of these last weeks of really profound tragedy and injustice. So in this moment of, of global grief, we um, will talk about Thoreau and loss uh, in his particular lifetimes and world. Uh, we also hope to make some connections to, to our own. So I'll, um, I'll start by, um, by posing a question and, uh, and I'll ask, um, Audrey to uh, respond first. Students of Thoreau know that he faced a lot of loss in his lifetime. He lost his best friend and brother, John, to uh, lockjaw very suddenly and tragically. He lost his sister, Helen, to tuberculosis and his father to tuberculosis. He lost to another man, the one woman he loved enough to propose to. And he lost friendships, wrote about them quite a bit, uh, most notably perhaps his friendship with, uh, with Emerson, once so very close and, and then not so much. You each have been studying Thoreau for some time and you've both come to 
uh, the, the theme of loss in his work and life is so central. So I was hoping that, you, hoping that you could start by explaining to us what first drew you to your central focus on loss as you've worked on Thoreau. How did loss seem so integral to you in your studies of him? Audrey? Well, I came to Thoreau rather late. I came to the Transcendentalists rather late. I, I raised myself on 19th century novels, mostly British, and I was always drawn to what Philip Aris calls the beautiful death and how just wonderfully people died in 19th century novels. And then when I started reading the Transcendentalists, um, well, I was, of course, very impressed. Um, but I noticed in Thoreau particularly, he wrote a lot. He writes a lot about loss, a lot. And uh, as I started reading him, um, I read the biographies. And his, his death was more beautiful than anything in a Victorian novel. It was really lovely. Um, and as we come to our moment in history, um, his death, nothing like the deaths that are going on around us now. Um, he didn't die with someone's knee on his neck for almost nine minutes. He didn't die alone in a room hooked to a ventilator. If he was lucky, maybe a nurse held his hand for a minute. Thoreau died surrounded by his family and friends. He died in a room filled with books and flowers. I'm not underestimating the physical suffering of dying of consumption, but just before he died, he asked to be raised up and he died in the loving arms of his mother and sister and his aunt Louisa. It seems that kind of death is not possible in our world. Thoreau lived in a very harsh world, but it seems that our world, if it's possible now, when it comes to death, is even more harsh. That's so um, poignant and, and sad to, to consider it in that light. Audrey, thank you. Um, uh, so I, I, just to echo R Rochelle's comments, I, I also want to acknowledge um, that we're coming together to talk about grief and life um, and mourning today uh, in a moment where it seems so important to acknowledge that the Black lives lost to, to police violence and white supremacy, um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the many, 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 too many others. Uh, that we are, as a society, I think, are only beginning to reckon with, but that, of course, Black people and Black communities have been reckoning with and mourning for centuries. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that it's just staggering number of lives lost in these last few months to COVID-19. I am sure there are people that are here with us today that have lost people um, to this truly terrible illness and as Audrey um, uh, alludes to, you know, a, an illness that not only takes away people's life and breath, but also isolates them in that moment uh, from their loved ones and families, which is um, just adds so much to the, to the tremendous sadness of, of that loss. Um, and so it feels, and with this, all of this grief kind of circulating around and among us, it feels um, really like um, an act of trust and great openness that uh, you have all uh, wanted to be here to, to think together about grief and, and loss. And I feel really grateful for that um, and to have been asked to be part of that. And um, I'm glad to be here with you to, to kind of feel that collective sadness. Um, so while I had known about the centrality of John's death to Thoreau's thinking and writing for a long time, uh, the theme of grief in his writing became particularly resonant for me after my father's death in 2016, which roughly coincided with the publication of um, Bronca Arsic's book, Bird Relics, which um, 
really transformed my my thinking about that the centrality of grief and and then you know many other many other um there have been many other writers on on Thoreau and grief Audrey and uh, um, Dan Peck's wonderful book Thoreau's Morning Work um, and also work by uh, Bill Rossi on on grief e equally important to me um, so at the time that, that I became interested in this theme, I had already spent a good deal of time with Thoreau's writings, uh, particularly working on the calendar project and the, the charts of seasonal phenomena. Um, so it was a sort of revelation to me to start thinking of his, these writings that I already knew in this new light. Um, and I guess the main thing that I just want to mention is I think now that I have begun looking at the work in that light, I, I, I see it everywhere. Um, so even statements or quotations from the journal that I, you know, knew well and had quoted many times suddenly became newly resonant for me. And I'll just give one example of that. Um, uh, there's a, a quotation from the journal that I probably quoted a dozen times and I stole the quotation uh, from Laura Walls's Seeing New Worlds. Um, and the, it's from November 5th, 1857. Uh, I think the man of science makes this mistake and the mass of mankind along with him that you should coolly give your chief attention to the phenomenon which excites you as something independent on you and not as it is related to you. Um, I had always read this journal passage as being sort of like about epistemology um, and about a certain kind of philosophical relation breaking down the barrier between subject and object. And of course it is that, uh, but now when I read that sentence, I, I hear so much um, of the affect of the feeling in it, that this is a statement of a person who really longs to feel connected, to feel part of nature and to sort of repair uh, relations to the more than human world, that he, um, he needs that, that connection. Um, so I guess just to conclude, you know, uh, reading the journal, reading Thoreau in general with that sense of need and vulnerability in mind really um, changed my relationship to Thoreau because it humanized him so much for me. And I began to see him as essentially like myself and everyone else that I know, not a sort of wise person with all the answers expounding a, a single vision of life, but as a a suffering person, a hurt person, um, not writing from on high uh, or from like a position of superiority, but truly as my neighbor, um, someone who like me was writing to try to make sense of his own life and to relate himself meaningfully to the world around him. Thanks to both of you so much. You, you clearly both bring such a depth and breadth of of interest and uh, knowledge of Thoreau. And I, I'm hoping that our, our listeners um, today will take advantage of that chat function to ask you about additional aspects of your work that they might be interested in. Um, for now though, uh, Kristen, I'm wondering if you could start um, in response to this next question. As you both well know, when Thoreau writes about loss, he often writes about political issues. And one of the most uh, memorable moments in his corpus um, is in uh, his essay, Slavery in Massachusetts. On July 4th, 1854, Thoreau spoke at the meeting of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And he spoke alongside Wendell Phillips, Sojourner Truth, William Lloyd Garrison and others. And Garrison, it was at that meeting that Garrison famously burned a copy of the US Constitution calling it a covenant with death, an agreement with hell. Thoreau spoke really forcefully at that meeting. And in the essay version of that lecture, Slavery in Massachusetts, he conjures loss as a state of political protest. He renounces both state and country and writes um, specifically with regard to the fugitive slave law. He writes, at last it occurred to me that what I had lost was a country. How is this form of political loss significant to your understandings of Thoreau and his work? Kristen, let's start with you. Um, this, this question feels so uh, resonant that it's kind of incredible, Rochelle, that you, that you actually wrote it several weeks ago. Um, 
so I don't know if what I will be able to say, if I'll be able to say what I, what I really want to say here clearly. Um, uh, I, I think that what Thoreau is registering in that sentence about losing his country um, is something like a loss of innocence, uh, a, lo a loss of a certain innocence about America um, that I think is so resonant so deeply resonant right now. Um, James Baldwin in, in his essay that opens uh, the book, The Fire Next Time, a short essay that is a letter to his nephew, um, writes so powerfully, I think, about um, the dangers of white innocence and the letting go of that innocence as a kind of requirement for spiritual maturity. Um, and so it's, it's so powerful to have in Thoreau's essay, a sort of monument to that moment, to, which is both a moment of great loss and also I think a moment of, of awakening, of really powerful awakening. Um, and then, you know, because you mentioned slavery in Massachusetts, I, I reread the essay and um, have been thinking about the way it connects grief and protest, as you say. Um, uh, I, I think, I just think it's so, so resonant um, again with with so much of what we're seeing right now. So I just wanted to read this one passage that I I thought was particularly powerful. Uh, so so here Thoreau is sort of um, paraphrasing the attitude of the state of Massachusetts as he sees it uh, toward the the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, do what you will, O oh government, with my wife and children, my mother and my brother, my father and sister. I will obey your commands to the letter. It will indeed grieve me if you hurt them, if you deliver them to overseers to be hunted by hounds or whipped to death. But nevertheless, I will peacefully pursue my chosen calling on this fair earth until perchance one day when I have put on mourning for them dead, I shall have you persuaded to relent. I shall have persuaded you to relent. Sorry, such is the attitude, such are the words of Massachusetts. Rather than do thus, I need not say what match I would touch, what system endeavor to blow up, but as I love my life, I would side with the light and let the dark earth roll from under me, calling my mother and my brother to follow. I'm so struck in reading this passage that Thoreau is describing racial injustice here in terms of physical harm to black bodies, bodies that are delivered to overseers and hunted by hounds. Uh, and that his insistence on siding with justice against the fugitive slave law is an insistence on registering personal grief at the violence inflicted on these bodies. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the beauty of the Black Lives Matter movement being in part its insistence on grief and its um, there's something so powerful, as I'm sure so many of you can testify, to hearing a crowd of people chanting, I can't breathe. Um, because we all, we all know what it feels like, even for a moment, to be unable to breathe. Um, and this somehow touches something about the vulnerability of being human uh, in us. And I think, um, you know, I was thinking this morning as I was preparing for this, grief is so personal. You know, grief, grief always speaks in the first person. Uh, and so when protest takes up the experience of grief, like bodily experience of grief, I think it's just enormously powerful. And I think that's something that Thoreau understood and was connected to. Thank you so much, Audrey. Well, um, recent events, uh, the last two weeks, have sort of brought home to me something I've felt for a long time, which is that the, the Civil War has never ended in this country. Um, that the repercussions of slavery, e e most everybody knows, have never ended in this country. And, um, the country that Thoreau lost has never been regained. And uh, I understood that. I've always understood that when I read his essay. I always understood that um, 
cruel and venal men ran our country and it was always for profit and not for love and not for compassion that people were governed and it was really no government at all and um but now seeing what's going on seeing what's going on uh i mean i have hope for the black lives matter movement of course um but now i can feel in my own heart what it's like to lose a country uh we are still governed by cruel and venal people and i know what it feels like to have to feel that you have lost a country and frankly i don't know when we're ever going to get it back um i'm not completely without hope but like henry i i'm not terribly optimistic I've been thinking uh, so much about Ben Franklin's speech in the convention these last weeks when he wrote uh, to his fellow writers of the Constitution that, of course, it was an imperfect document, but that the nation needed something to begin and uh, that it was very likely that um, we would eventually see tyranny and despotism the hope that he argued we needed to hold to in order to start a country seems um, very much, I agree with you both, like the hope that Thoreau realized the loss of and that we are uh, also feeling today. Thank you so much. Kristen, did you wanna pick up on, on Audrey's remarks at all? Um. Well, I guess only just to say, you know, I think it's such a complicated thing because of course there are so many people in this country who have never had the privilege of, um, of innocence about America. Um, and, and I think it's important to bear, both bear that in mind and also really mourn the, the loss. It's a real loss, right? The loss of belief that there is a kind of innocence or goodness innate in one's country. Um, it's so important, I think, to accept that, that loss and to, to, to choose the truth over one's clinging to, to that idea. Um, but I think it is also, you know, um, important to mourn it. And so I, I want to hold space for both, you know, people who are saying, I never had any, how could I ever, how, how could I ever have any illusions about what America means or is, right? That that is, that's right. Um, uh, and also the, the real loss that is, that is felt for those of us who, who cherished at some point some, some ideal of American exceptionalism. Uh, thank you. We, uh, Thoreau, when he was writing those words was of course responding um, generally to the fugitive slave law and to the history of uh, re-enslavement, but more specifically to the Anthony Burns case that, that was just rocking Boston and in his world when Anthony Burns was brought back into slavery after having been a free man. And so this, I, I, this resonance that you're both pointing out is um, so, so racially uh, tied. I really appreciate you're both acknowledging that so fully. Um, let me move on to the next question and um, and turn us toward a different aspect, perhaps, of Thoreau's um, focus on loss. Sometimes loss seems to serve Thoreau well. And in fact, sometimes he pursues it. During his Walden experiment, he deliberately cultivates some forms of loss in order to live deliberately, in order to simplify, simplify. And these are sort of material um, forms of loss. But he also cultivates loss in forms other than physical ones. He writes of getting lost in the woods at night in Walden. He writes of a more metaphoric getting lost, saying not till we are lost, in other words, not till we have lost the world, 
do we begin to find ourselves and realize where we are in the infinite extent of our relations. And like so much of what we're reading in Thoreau today, even those words seem um, quite relevant to where, where we are. So many of us are so are feeling so incredibly lost these days. Uh, we feel that we've lost the world as, as we knew it. And we've lost hope, as you're pointing out. Um, we've, we've felt desperately the need to focus much more thoroughly on, on racial justice and equity. What do you think Thoreau is, is getting at when he says those words, not till we are lost, not till we have lost the world, do we begin, do we begin to find ourselves? How do those words speak to you? Audrey, let's that start with you this time. Yeah, let's start with you. Okay. Um, well, I have always um, thought that he was using the, the, um, the phrase, the world, uh, in the sense that his Puritan forebears did. Um, the idea of, for one of a better phrase, shaking off the mortal coil of this world for a higher spiritual existence, but being a transcendentalist and not a Puritan, he felt that that could be done in this life and not in the next life. And um, he believed that that could be done um, in, a, in a kind of stepping outside of the self, a kind of shadow self. Elsewhere in Walden, he says um, that um, he could, uh, a man can be um, completely sane and with uh, Islam, no, not completely sane, uh, can be beside himself, I'm sorry, beside himself and have all of his senses. And I think that this shadow self that he creates is our better self. It's kind of our soul and it's the secret self that watches us. Um, it's sort of like in Baker's Farm, he talks about his shadow, of course, this is a humorous passage, he talks about a shadow having a light all around it, like one of the elect. But um, when he's humorous, he's always serious. And he is saying that there is a way that we can step outside and observe ourselves. And if we can step outside and observe ourselves, there's the possibility that we can step outside of ourselves and observe other people too. And if we can step outside and observe other people too, we might be able to see them in the 19th century sense of sympathy, which is fellow feeling. And if that's the case, that kind of fellow feeling is what's desperately needed today. Thanks, Audrey. That was so lovely. I love that. Um, I'm going to keep thinking about that idea of the shadow self. That's really, it's really helpful and, and lovely as a gloss on that reading of the being beside oneself in a sane sense, which is a, such a, a favorite moment of mine. Um, I do think, uh, thinking about this, this, this idea of being lost, um, losing the world and, um, in order to find ourselves is, is, is resonant. Um, I, I mean, I have to say, I do think as painful as it is, there is some hope in this moment. I really feel that. Um, I do think it's possible that we could use this moment of c collective vulnerability and loss to, to transform some pretty basic things about our society. I think a lot of people are feeling that and tapping into that that hope. Um, one of the lines of, from Walden that I love the most and think about all the time is, uh, there is only one way we say, but there are as many ways as can be drawn radii from one center. And I think we are beginning to reimagine our society in some profound ways from, you know, higher education to healthcare um, and to most recently the, the role of prisons and, and the police in our society. Uh, the legacy of the Civil War, I think, is like suddenly being um, uh, reconceived in this moment. All these statues coming down suddenly after years and years and suddenly and not suddenly, you know, as these things happen. Um, so, 
you know, and, and I think that's a very, you know, a profound legacy of Thoreau, is that the courage to imagine, the courage to reimagine everything. Um, uh, I think for many of us, there's been a huge shift in our daily life, beginning with the stay-at-home orders um, and amplified now by the protests uh, that have required us to adapt to totally new ways of being in the world, like what we're doing right now, right? Like this is an adaptation, it's a totally new way. Zoom remains a totally new way for me of being in the world. Um, and if there's one thing we know from the Walden experiment, um, it's that a totally new way of being in the world has the advantage of letting you see your, your normal life and your society's normal life from a new perspective. Um, I don't want to overstate the silver lining here. Um, it seems important to say, like, I still have a job and I, and I haven't lost a loved one to this illness. And so I really don't want to be sort of sanguine about the, 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 the truly unfathomable costs. Um, the costs are unbearably steep and I don't think we've really registered them kind of collectively. Uh, and we won't have registered them, I don't think, fully for a long time. Um, but I think this experience is changing us uh, and that we're all registering those changes in deeply personal and collective ways. Um, this thing of just not being able to see people, uh, you know, not being able to interact with those kind of everyday interactions, I think we're all learning together how much those little interactions mean to us. Um, and by the way, this seems a good moment to say, I've been thinking a lot about the, the, the massive debt that we all owe Laura Walls um, in restoring to popular imagination, in restoring to, to collective imagination, the social Thoreau, um, right? Like the, the Thoreau who was deeply socially engaged. It just seems uh, such an achievement to have restored that to our collective imagination. Um, and so I feel really grateful for that in this moment that I'm able to think with Thoreau as a social being and not someone who represents American individualism and isolation. Um, uh, but this, you know, all of this seems to me part of what's hopeful about this moment. It's teaching us something about how much we need and value each other um, and teaching us that we need to learn to take better care of each other too, I think. Thank you. Audrey, did you want to respond to that? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, it has been uh, encouraging for, for those of us who spend so much time talking about Thoreau to uh, celebrate the, the broader public recognition through Laura, of, um, through Laura Walls' biography of the, the public thorough, the political thorough, um, working to dismantle this idea of him as, as the reclusive hermit. And it's also been heartening to see so many people turning to Thoreau in these last weeks of, of disease and of, and of grief and of uh, political tragedy. Um, it, it seems that every magazine and newspaper is suddenly featuring a, a editorial reinvoking him and uh, I read just yesterday that sales of Walden have hit all-time highs <laughs> which is which is fascinating so so clearly yeah, the relevance is, um, is being realized I want to turn to one of the most famous uh, passages that Thoreau wrote about loss and it's sort of going to frustrate folks that I do so probably because more has been written about this passage than perhaps any other passage in Thoreau's corpus and, and we still don't know what it means. Um, but uh, we're not gonna solve the riddle, but I wanna turn to it for just a minute in order to raise a certain question. So one of the, the most elusive and famous passages of Walden centers on loss. Thoreau writes, I long ago lost a hound, a bay horse, and a turtle dove, and am still on their trail. Many are the travelers I have spoken concerning them, describing their tracks and what calls they answered to. I have met one or two who have heard the hound and the tramp of the horse, and even seen the dove disappear behind a cloud. And they seemed as anxious to recover them as if they had lost them themselves. 
So as I say, we won't solve the riddle of, of what this means here, but I wanted to offer those beautiful words from Walden as an invitation for you to reflect on Thoreau's sense that loss, even the most grief-filled, horrific loss, could also be beautiful. Can you explain how he saw loss in this way in his time, and perhaps how his vision might speak to us now? And I guess, Kristen, we'll start with you for this one. Um, yeah, I, so I, I don't have a solution for the riddle. I'm eagerly, uh, uh, maybe someone will, maybe Audrey will, or maybe someone will in the, in the, in the questions and comments portion afterwards. Um, but I do note, you know, that that beautiful, to me, the most beautiful moment is as they seemed as anxious to recover them as if they had lost them themselves. This, this moment of like, here, here is somehow the point of deepest human connection, this around what we have lost, and that like every loss is somehow connected to every other loss, every other deep loss. Um, and, and there's something there is, some, you're right, I'm so glad you, I'm so glad you had this instinct to talk about beauty. I mean, I think there is something really beautiful about that kind of intense vulnerability when you're willing to experience it. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's like at the core of life, it's like holding a newborn baby, you know, that at that, or that, or or accompanying someone who is dying, right? Like that intense fragility of human life, I think is part of what we're all feeling right now. And, and it is true that one of the things that makes us feel is our solidarity with each other, our connection to each other. Um, uh, I think of the, the, the beautiful journal entry that Thoreau wrote in 1842, just before John's death, um, of what manner of stuff is the web of the, of time wove when these consecutive sounds called the strain of music can be wafted down through the centuries from Homer to me and Homer have been conversant with the same unfathomable mystery and charm which so new tingles my ears am I so like thee my brother that the cadence of two notes affects us alike um, I just love that passage and I love that he's thinking about this in this moment of watching his brother slip away from him feeling this intense connection, not only to him, but to kind of everyone through history, this sense of loss as so such a, a force of, of human connection. Um, and then, I don't know, I, I just, I felt like I wanted to, I really wanted to say that um, I think there's a danger thinking about what it means to be lost. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that you know, for me, um, I have a vested interest in making Thoreau the answer to every question. <laughs> and, um, but of course he can't, he can't be the, the answer to every question. And, and part of, an important part of what it means for me right now to feel uh, a certain kind of lostness or letting go is letting go of, of expertise. Um, and so I, I wanted to make a gesture in the direction of a writer with whom I'm much less conversant, but, but to whom I, it feels really important um, for me to listen right now. And that's, uh, that's James Baldwin. Um, so my apologies for bringing Baldwin into a discussion about Thoreau, but he's on the same theme and, and it strikes me as, uh, as important. Um, so this is just, I think this is so beautiful and it's really about this sense of connection between um, uh, death and, and solidarity. Um, he writes, life is tragic because the earth turns and the sun inexorably rises and sets and one day for each of us, the sun will go down for the last, last time. Perhaps the whole root of our trouble, the human trouble, is that we will sacrifice all the beauty of our lives, we'll imprison ourselves in totems, taboos, crosses, blood sacrifices, steeples, mosques, races, armies, flags, nations in order to deny the fact of death, which is the only fact we have. It seems to me that one ought to rejoice in the fact of death, ought to decide indeed to earn one's death by confronting with passion the conundrum of life. One is responsible to life. It is the small beacon in the terrifying darkness from which we come and to which we shall return. 
one must negotiate this passage as nobly as possible for the sake of those who are coming after us. Um, and so I just wanted to close my remarks with that because uh, Baldwin has been such an important voice for me to listen to right now. Thanks, Kristen. What beautiful words. And we never have to apologize for invoking James Baldwin. <laughs> I appreciate that so very much. What a, what a helpful, a helpful passage. Audrey, do you want to address um, that question? Like Kristen, I also want to talk about um, loss being throughout history. And um, well, most everybody agrees that the bay horse and the hound and the turtle dove are universal symbols of loss and we can attach whatever meaning to them that we see fit. But what always has intrigued me about that passage is the expression long ago. Because he was 28 when he went to the pond. Now I'm not sure what draft he added that passage in. But even when he turned in the final draft in 1854, he was still a very young man. He didn't have a lot of long ago in his lifetime. So I think the long ago is not just the duration of his life. I think the long ago is the duration of human history and beyond. The fact that he talks about animals, the loss of animals, talks about uh, loss as the condition of the history of the earth. And uh, and the language that he uses in this passage seems to speak to something that everybody shares. It's it sounds so lonely. I lost long ago. And yet everybody lost long ago. And everybody will lose long in the future. We all share that experience of loss. And in a sense, that binds us together that bound Thoreau to his neighbors, who in other respects, he didn't find so um, agreeable. <laughs> and uh, I think that the long ago in the passage is, is, is really key to understanding it. Thanks to you both for such informed and, and really thoughtful responses um, to that. And Michael Frederick is showing his face. That's, um, that's our sign that it's time to shift things. Michael? Me? Thank you. I've been listening with rapt attention about the hound, the bay horse, and the turtle dove, and the conversation that's been going on today on this important topic. So there are a few questions that have come in from the audience, and I'd like to share them with you. The first one I'll just... Um, present uh, as an open question to, um, to all of you. I ran into the great ground shifting loss of country in my life when I was drafted into the army in 1968. I have processed that on my own in quiet. For Thoreau, as I have learned his words and felt his emotional power, it was his gap in his journal after the death of his brother and how he picked up his work and after his life, after that, with grief always there, it would seem in the background. Can you address the aspects of creative power of that kind of grieving in life and personal carrying on in family life and in the church of nature? Yes. What a wonderful question. Thanks um, to the, the poser of that question. Um, Audrey, Kristen, I, uh, it's such a lovely question. I'm tempted to just <laughs> speak to it immediately, um, but I want to give you the opportunity to do that, of course. Uh, Kristen, and then perhaps Audrey? Yeah, I guess I will just say I'm going to try to not 
I could feel like I could talk about this for 10 minutes. So I'm going to try really hard not to do that. Um, I, I think um, this is so important um, and, and a beautiful question. I, I mean, I think to me, the shift in my own understanding was when I began to see Thoreau's writing as work that he was doing ongoingly to repair his own life and to repair to and that, that's like an it's not an act that's ever finished that's not a work that is ever completed um that's that's work that that is daily and that accrues quietly and that gets undone and has to be redone again um that there was a kind of almost a ritual quality to the journal writing that had to do with with repairing loss and finding reconnection uh, to the natural world as part of that uh, part of that repair work um, that that gave me so much um, uh, I felt closer to Thoreau after after beginning to read him in that way because then it was it was no longer about like oh Thoreau says X or Thoreau says Y or Thoreau's stance is this um, it was much more like uh, how is this work happening today? Um, how can I how can I heal my life, the life of my my place, uh, my planet in these small ways today? Uh, and and thinking about writing as something that can participate in that work. Audrey. I thought the most beautiful part of that question was the very end when he said the church, he or she, said the, the church of nature. And that really is how Thoreau saw nature. Uh, that he, he said it many times that that was where he went to worship God. Uh, his God did not live in a church. And, um, and he said that there was something sanctifying and purifying in nature, that there was eternal innocence. And I think Thoreau found healing in nature. And I think that is how Art Questioner found some of his healing in nature and was perhaps led there by reading Thoreau. Thanks so much to you both. That um, the question to me conjured the many moments in uh, in Thoreau's published writings and in his journal when he's so grief stricken, whether by uh, a human loss or a, a social um, injustice that he's grappling with, and he goes to the natural world intentionally, hoping to um, to find some sort of balm to find some sort of healing. And I, I so admire the way in which he captures the, um, the fragility of, of those moments, because much of the time, he actually writes that he cannot find the balm <laughs> that he seeks in the natural world because his suffering is so encompassing that it's um, uh, clouding, as it were, his, his ability to to reach that um, healing through nature. And then of course, there are the moments when, when he does find the white, the water lily, the white, the white lily, excuse me, at the end of uh, slavery, Massachusetts, and in the moments in Walden, when he does find the connection to natural phenomena that reinvigorates his, his hope. Um, but your, your answers to that question just spoke so beautifully to, to both of those angles in Thoreau's work. Can I just say, Rochelle, quickly, I just want to say, I'm so glad you mentioned that, those moments of being unable to find. I mean, those moments are just so devastating in the journal. And talk about grief. It's just important, I think, that we, that we mention those moments, because to me, they're, they're some of the most grief-saturated moments uh, it, uh, when he is unable to find that connection with nature that is his as you say, his, his balm, his sense of spiritual grounding. And it's, it's truly devastating those moments when, when he can't. And so I'm, I'm just glad that you, that you mentioned that.
I think we have time for one more question. So this one is from a psychotherapist. They say, I'm a psychotherapist and study grief intrapsychically and interpersonally. What part of Thoreau would you recommend studying first? The grief process is central to the psychodynamic therapy. I'd like to answer this one. Um, I think that Thoreau's life, I know that Thoreau's life, as Rochelle mentioned in her questions, was full of grief. And um, we know that he, uh, he went to nature for his, for solace, for his grief. He went to writing for solace, for his grief. But he also went to interpersonal relationships for his grief. He was very close to his family. Um, of course, many of them died on him. But, uh, he, but to the end of his life, he had such close relations with his mother and his sister Sophia. And these bonds, these bonds, I think, really helped him. There are passages in the journal where he writes about being up in his attic study um, and hearing Sophia playing on the piano and being drawn down like the spring has been um, late in coming to him, later in coming to him than, in out, than outside. And his sister playing the piano brings spring to him and brings him downstairs. So I, I think he dealt with grief on those three levels, nature, writing, and interpersonally. Thank you, Audrey. Kristen? In terms of a recommendation of like where to start in, in terms of looking at, at grief, I think, you know, maybe a week, which is the, the elegy, the extended elegy um, to John. But I do think, you know, also may be helpful to, to, to read the biography because, because it's so, you know, it is possible to read Thoreau and not think about grief. I think if one doesn't come, it's, it's, it's a quiet strain um, that is woven through, through everything. Um, and I think it's helpful to kind of know the context, the biographical context as you d delve into the work. Um, and then it kind of illuminates all corners. Thanks to you both. It, it seems also that at our, at our present moment, um, some of Thoreau's political writings, which certainly demonstrate his, his uh, grief about nation, they might be uh, relevant also. Okay. And I find often in Thoreau's writings that grief can be uh, somewhat abstracted because he's not necessarily directing it to a person, even in a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, where his first book was a tribute, a memorial to his brother John, who had died not to, um, who had died recently. And Thoreau never mentions John by name. So one of the places I think we can go um, for Thoreau's interpersonal relations. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, there's Laura Dasa Walls' biography, and she does an excellent job bringing, bringing out the human Thoreau, the human side. Um, but also, um, we could turn to um, Ralph Waldo Emerson's son, um, Edward Emerson, who was a new Thoreau as a, as a young man, as a boy, and who um, later on wrote a book about the curmudgeon of Concord. And he titled it, Henry Thoreau is Remembered by a Young Friend. And it's a, um, it's a compelling look at, at Thoreau that really brings forth a sort of a, a, a warm person that we don't necessarily get elsewhere. So I would, I would recommend um, reading that book. So unless, um, Rochelle or Kristen, Audrey, do you have anything else to add? We're just about at the end of our meeting now. 
I, I do want to thank Kristen and Audrey so much um, and point people to Audrey's book if they haven't read it uh, and to Kristen's work as well. Um, they're, they're just as aspects of their work that we didn't have time to discuss today, but that are, are so um, worthy. So I want to recommend them and the thanks to you both. And thanks for having me, Mike. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to host everybody. And also uh, thanks to th um, the Thoreau Farm. I'm here in the Thoreau birth room at the Thoreau house in Concord on Virginia Road. And um, Thoreau Farm has always been a great partner with the Thoreau Society. Thank you so much, Mike, and, and, and everyone, Audrey and Rochelle, and everyone for being here. It was lovely. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kristen, Rochelle, and Mike, and thank you to the audience. I'm thank sure you. we missed a lot of terrific questions. But I know who sent in the second one. <laughs> well, join us next week when we'll have a full weekend of webinars. Plenty of opportunity to carry on the conversation.